Welcome to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp, President of Sharp Research and Translation. Our show today, a close-up comparative view of Taiwan and Hong Kong politics. Joining us via Skype from New Hampshire, where it's about to snow, uh, is Dr. Stephen M. Young. Um, Dr. Young recently retired from the United States Department of State. Uh, during his uh, career uh, with the department, he served as ambassador to Kyrgyzstan and also de facto ambassador to Taiwan, as well as consul general in Hong Kong, a position which is essentially an ambassadorial position. Welcome to Think Tech Asia. Thank you very much. Nice to be there. Great. Glad you could join us. Uh, join us and. Uh, you know, with that snow pending in New Hampshire, it was a little bit fearful. We, we might have some technical problems here, but it looks like everything is going very well. Um, well, I just to point out our temperatures aren't that different. You're 81 and we're 18, so we just reverse <laughs> the numbers. <laughs> we just invert the numbers, <laughs> reverse them. Oh, well. Um, well, you certainly have a lot of experience in Taiwan. As I recall, you first went there with your father, who uh, was a military officer serving in the old Military Assistance Command. Uh, you served one of your earlier tours uh, as a junior officer in Taiwan, and then, of course, um, the time as ambassador. I I'm just wondering, um, given your experience in Taiwan, uh, how do you see um, Taiwan in the wake of the 9-1 election? Well, it's a big question, and it's good to be on your show, Bill. I will add that I was there in advanced language training about 25 years ago, and then uh, I was the number two, the deputy director of AIT uh, in uh, the late Li Donghui years, and then into the uh, uh, election of Chen Shui-bian in the first DPP administration. So I do have a perspective. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, as a big supporter of Taiwan's democracy, I would point out that uh, the holding of regular elections in which both sides accept the results and the orderly way in which these elections have been held should be highlighted for, for anyone who cares about Taiwan and its, and its uh, historical trajectory. So the fact that uh, not the uh, elections six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, were, were orderly, even though they were rather um, earth-shaking in terms of political con consequences, is a good sign. Uh, that said, uh, it highlights the necessity more than ever for the two parties to find some common ground if they're going to get anything done. That's a very interesting point. How how would you think they could find some common ground? Because this is, this is something I often think about myself. I mean, Taiwan society is so divided and so acerbic. Um, I, I sometimes say that the, the, the legislature sometimes makes the U.S. Congress look good. Um, but what, what would you, how would you um, bring some sort of sense of unity to Taiwan, right? especially to Taiwan politics? Well, Obviously, the economy is a big issue there, and as I understand it, from this uh, distant vantage point, economic issues were a key element of the local elections that were held in, uh, uh, was it the end of November? The right, November of the 29th, yeah. right. Yeah, um, so uh, I think that both uh, the KMT and the DPP have to look at those issues. Uh, as they prepare for the uh, legislative and presidential elections in about a year uh, and ask themselves some questions. If you go back to the Sunflower Movement, as I understand it, there was also some anxiety about Taiwan becoming overly dependent on China. Mm. So the question of China's role in Taiwan's economy, which is an important one, uh, is probably going to be a, a, a major subject of discussion over the course of the next 12 months. Yeah, it does seem that, 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 that um, a large segment of Taiwan society is increasingly concerned about um, Taiwan's dependence on China, and it seems like the KMT is trying to minimize uh, that perception. But, you know, I think the statistics pretty well speak for themselves. We're not alone. I mean, all of Asia has the same question. The United States has this question. China's rise economically brings uh, opportunities and challenges to all of us.
Mm. Mm. Taiwan is obviously special because of its um, uh, uh, contested uh, sovereignty and so forth. Um, you know what is really curious to me is as, as we lead up to the presidential and legislative elections in 2016, which is, they probably will be in very early 2016, uh, not that far away, um, just what kind of role or, or sort of, um, how should I say, yeah, role, I guess is the best word, might the, you know, swing voters play in the upcoming presidential election? Is there really the substance of a an evolving third force in Taiwan politics that might, a, a force that would essentially say, look, DPP, KMT, we're tired of you guys. We're tired of both of you. We want something different. We're ready for a new political persona. Do you see that happening? And we're not talking about the United States, sorry. <laughs> We, we could be, but <laughs> that's a different show. <laughs> um, obviously, we're very, very used to the two-party system in the United States, and as we saw the um, emergence in the 80s and 90s of the DPP as uh, as a challenger to Guomindang uh, uh, dominance of politics, a lot of us thought, well, this is good. You know, now you're going to have two parties. Um, third parties both in our country and in Taiwan, have been a factor before. I think uh, the PPP, the PFP, the uh, People's First Party that James Song founded after his his loss in uh, 2000, and also Liu Donghui's Taiwan Solidarity Party suggests that. But just as we've seen difficulties in America with a third party getting the traction to really supplant one of the other parties or become a, a, an equal factor, suggests that there's something about politics that makes it more complicated for people to have to, 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 to look three different ways. So uh, there might be the emergence of a new uh, independent party or, or, or separate party, but there's also the possibility that two parties, the DPP and the KMT, will try and reorder their approach both to economic issues, cross-trade issues, and, and, and other uh, matters of importance to the Taiwan electorate to win back those that they've lost. Mm. Now, um, during your time in Taiwan, uh, especially as ambassador, I believe you had a reasonable amount of interaction with James Song. Um, what, what's your take on him? Well, James Song was a very capable uh, administrator when he was the governor of Taiwan uh, back in the 90s. And um, I think he would have been president in 2000 if uh, Lee dong had not uh, driven him from the party and chosen the less uh, 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 popular Lian John as the KMT candidate. Because remember, Chen Sui-bian won with only 39% right. of the vote in, uh, through. in March of, uh, of 2000. I was there and it was quite an exciting time, a, a stunning time in Taiwan politics. But uh, what that meant was that Song, with 37%, could easily have won if uh, the KMT candidate, Lan John, hadn't siphoned off 23% of the Pan Blue vote. So, um, uh, you know, and the fact that it's not a first-past-the-poll system so that uh, it would have been Song against Chen back in 2000 if that was the case, as is, as is the instance in many other places, made an interesting victory for, for Chen Sui-bian. And he did have some trouble governing because he didn't have a strong mandate. Mm. Mm. But uh, James Sung um, has lost a lot of popularity if you judge his uh, campaign in the 2012 election where he only got a percent or two of the vote. So, And I don't hear much about the PFP, so I'm not sure that... Uh, uh, he or a third party are going to play a major role in what happens over the next year. Mm. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. It's 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 a it's a very attractive idea, but it, they, this um, the presidential election is only about a year away. That's very very little time. Um, well, he's working well, very closely with Mr. If, Ko now. Um, if, if he form a new party, that would be probably a different matter. Although. Uh, I'm not sure what his appeal is outside of Greater Taipei. Hmm. Yeah, interesting point. 
Um, now, I wonder if you've had the opportunity to observe Mr. Ko's uh, first uh, few weeks in office, and, and if so, what your uh, impression might be. I, I really haven't uh, formed a strong impression of him, but obviously he's going to have to work with the two other parties to get anything done uh, nationally. And even in, in uh, uh, the city of, of Taipei, which has traditionally been a very blue city, mm -hmm. um, he's, he's going to have to be pretty ecumenical to, uh, to build the strength to get things done in a, in a busy and, 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 and changing city. Um, and so I, I'm watching just like you, but I haven't got a real sense yet of, of, of where he's going. He obviously has some appeal by being not a professional politician so much as a, a medical professional who got into politics rather recently. And that probably appeals to people who are tired of those sort of zero-sum battles of the two uh, main parties there. Well, over the years, you've had plenty of opportunity to observe Lian Zhan, and uh, I imagine you've spoken with him on numerous occasions. What's your take on him? Well, I'm a little prejudiced by the fact that uh, Lian Zhan and I both got our PhDs from the University of Chicago. Okay, fair enough. That's your uh, disclaimer. <laughs> but, but, you know, Lian... I first got to know when he was vice president, but he did, did pretty much every job in the book. If I recall correctly, he was foreign minister, um, uh, ec possibly economics, but premier, uh, 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 vice president, and, and uh, so he brought a lot to the table. Um, the perception of a lot of people in Taiwan was, was A, that he was a little bit detached from ordinary life, uh, and now that you've got genuinely popular elections, that makes it harder for, for him to, to win. Uh, he obviously didn't do well in 2000. He and James Sung on the ballot in 2004 did better, but, but fell short by about 30,000 votes or whatever it was. Um, there were stories about Mr. Lin during the campaign in 2000 that suggested that he really wasn't a good campaigner. The way they described it was he'd get out of his car to meet a group of local politi political people, lo local uh, uh, folks, and he'd start looking at his watch to see how long he had to do it. Whereas a good politician, you know, like let's take Bill Clinton perhaps, right, which has, right. and dives into the crowd and is, is, is flesh in the flesh and seems like he couldn't be happier being anywhere else. Um, and that's a challenge for a guy who may be a terrific political thinker uh, 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 Lin was was a, a professor and and had, as I said, much experience in government to translate that into popular appeal. Mm. Hey, I, I was I read a very interesting article recently, and I forget just off the top of my head what publication it came from, but it was rating the ranking the top um, political families in Taiwan, and right at the top of the list was Lin Zhan. But I wonder, with the defeat of his son to the mayoral position of Taipei, um, the second most important position, political position in Taiwan next to the president, and given the fact that he was so enthusiastic about his, uh, his son's bid for office um, and campaigned a lot for him, um, if this doesn't spell the end or at least um, the end of his political career, uh, a definite tapering of his political influence, uh, or is this a kind of guy that will, um, you know, rise again? I, I, I guess I'll answer obliquely by saying that uh, I think uh, his father has gained a reputation of being a little too close to mainland China. Mm. That has probably had a, 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 a dragging effect on, uh, on the son's um, appeal to voters there, because as I understand it, certainly since the uh, Sunflower Movement uh, of nine months ago, uh, 10 months ago, there's, there's some anxiety that, that, that you have to monitor and regulate relations with the mainland to avoid having them become uh, too dominant and uh, uh, with uh, 
uh, concerning political implications. I mean, let's get the, the out on the table, but uh, it's clear China wants to reunify with Taiwan, and m many people in Taiwan are nervous that economic ties are seen as a tool, a, uh, a, a, a camel's nose in the tent on moving toward closer political ties and eventual reunification, which is a touchy issue in Taiwan. Mm. Lin John's frequent uh, uh, meetings with senior leaders of China and the very warm um, uh, uh, empathy he seems to have for people like Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping uh, is probably a mixed blessing in terms of he and his son's appeal to the electorate in Taiwan. Mm. That's a very interesting comment. Okay, we're going to take a break here. Uh, you're watching Think Tank Asia. I'm your host, uh, Bill Sharp. Our guest is Dr. Stephen M. Young, joining us via Skype from New Hampshire, and we'll be right back. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of this program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which, please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the Internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, King Zilli, for The Yap Show. Every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us here live, Think Tech Hawaii, and then later on, we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, life's <laughs> like, hey, right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Okay. Welcome back to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Dr. Stephen M. Young, uh, who is joining us from New Hampshire. Uh, Dr. Young served as uh, ambassador to Taiwan. We've been talking about uh, Taiwan politics, especially in the wake of the 9-1 election, which was held um, on uh, November 29th. Um, Okay, well, we talked about Nan John. Uh, we talked about um, James Song. Now, I, um, I, I realize you, you probably haven't had the opportunity to meet Mr. Ko, so um, maybe, maybe there's not too much we can say about uh, him. Um, the DPP, um, you've met Tsai Ing-wen a number of times, I'm sure. Uh, what's your take on her? Well, I knew... Uh, Madam Tsai in the 90s when she was a quiet advisor to the Lee Dong Hui administration and I was impressed from the start by her intellect and her seriousness. I, I at the time wouldn't have projected her as a uh, politician because the first impressions I had was of a very wonky lady and, and I don't say that in a bad sense but 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 you know I remember she'd fly to London on vacation. I'd say, what did you do there? She says, oh, I, I went through all the bookstores looking for interesting economic books. And I said, I said, Miss Tsai, London's got so many other fun things you should have done there. <laughs> but, it, but it just highlighted that what a very serious lady she is. She has a, a lovely sense of humor, though, and I, and I like her. Uh, I, I've known her... In, in various uh, positions uh, as the uh, head of the Mainland Affairs Council, as the vice premier, uh, as the party chairwoman. And she is quite able. She, ha she inspires confidence in the people around her. And uh, I think uh, particularly if economic issues are a big deal, she's going to have a lot of appeal to people who maybe want somebody who's less of a politician and more of a, of a technocrat. You know, one observation I made about Taiwan leaders is they're, they're highly intelligent. Um, educational level is very high. Uh, a, a very high percentage of them I study in the United States or Britain or some other overseas place. But sometimes they seem to be a little weak on leadership. 
Um, I wonder if you share that view, and if possibly that might also appeal to Masai. What's, what's her leadership potential? She's well, certainly got the intellectual attributes. Yeah. First of all, let me share a joke that, that was going the rounds when I was in Taiwan in the 90s, and that was that there were more American PhDs or advanced uh, degrees in the Taiwan cabinet than the American cabinet. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> That's probably true. Um, and obviously, Lu Donghui was an example who studied in, in Iowa and Cornell and um, Manjo. Uh, I, I think she has leadership capabilities, and she's shown them as the uh, chairwoman of the of the party. She also ran a tough campaign against uh, uh, Manjo in 2012. I think the odds were tough for her because uh, he was the incumbent. He had the KMT organization, which has historically been stronger than the KMT one, and yet she pulled pretty well. She certainly did a lot better than Frank Shea had done in, uh, two, in 2008. So um, while I was not there for the campaign, I, I knowing Madam Tsai reasonably well, I, I think she can, I mean, she's not going to be, you know, bringing herself down to the level of the ordinary voter in the crass sense. But mm -hmm. she can speak to their interests and their concerns. And that's what a good politician needs to do. So I, I, I think she's a formidable candidate. Uh, very, very interesting. She certainly has brought life back to the DPP after its 2008 drubbing when the party, you know, at that time, as I recall, a lot of people were wondering if the DPP would, you know, remain a political party in Taiwan. Well, I, I want to throw out one other fellow that always impressed me, although I guess he's, he's not been as uh, able to get the national attention that he might have, and that's Su Tsung Chung, uh, mm. who was the vice presidential candidate in 2008 and uh, had been a capable uh, administrator down in Ping Durham County. And when he was the premier, uh, I worked closely with him uh, during the Chen Sui Bien era, and, uh, and I found him a good man to work with. Mm. Um, I think uh, the tough um, conclusion is that Tsai Ing-wen has got even stronger capabilities. A, a recent study I read, um, it suggested that um, of all the, um, the magistrates, and I see now in the press they're beginning to refer to them as commissioners rather than magistrates, they give the DPP magistrates commissioners very high marks. The top three um, commissioners in Taiwan all seem to be of the DPP party. Uh, William Lai in Tainan gets very high marks. Um, uh, Chen Zhu in Kaohsiung gets very high marks. The commissioner for Elon County gets very high marks. The, uh, it just seems the DPP needs to spread its experience um, its, uh, of governing to these newly, uh, the, the people that have been just recently elected to these important positions many of whom don't seem to have a whole lot of uh, previous governing experience. Well, Chen zhu has been around for a while now, and I was very impressed by her um, when I got to know her as the uh, candidate and then the, the mayor of, of Gaoshan, which I have a soft place in my heart for because that's where I lived for two years when I was uh, uh, with my father in the 1960s. So you Beautiful lived in both state. the north and the south. Well, that's good, yeah. Yes, it's a beautiful city. The weather is nicer down south. There's no question about that. <laughs> well, um, you know, um, no. You, I, I, they, should, they should use that talent. You know, they should uh, uh, take advantage of the kind of people like uh, William Lai. And, 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 and I think Chen Zhu doesn't really aspire to a higher office than Gaussian. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, a good party looks for talent and tries to cultivate it. And in that regard, you and I have talked off air about uh, Eric Ju. Uh, I, well, met I was Eric, just going to ask you about. <laughs> go on. I, I met Eric uh, when I was um, the director, and he was the uh, commissioner or, or, or magistrate for uh, uh, Taiyuan. And I was struck by a couple of things. One, he was the first KMT leader of, 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 of real uh, of prominence who wasn't a lawyer, uh, he was proud to tell me that he'd studied accounting and that he had a, an ability to organize facts and so forth in a way that was 
different than, than, than the legal profession might might do. And I say that as somebody married to a very capable lawyer. Uh, but he was also uh, very uh, young. I mean, he was, I think, 47 when I met him. And uh, the KMT at that time seemed to be the party of aging men because uh, uh, it was hard to find anybody who was under 60. So the fact that he's uh, risen to greater prominence uh, doesn't surprise me. Mm, mm, interesting. Well, I'm sure all eyes are on him right now, having just taken over the chair position of the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, KMT. Um, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how his approach might be different from Ma's. Uh, more and more things I read say that these are really two very different people. So I'm just kind of waiting to see how he, how he does in that position. I am too, but I, I, I don't have a, a doubt that he will be very capable because I think he's got good people skills as well as uh, very good political sense and analytical skills. Well, we want to move on to talk about Hong Kong here in just a minute, but uh, before we do, I've got to ask you this question. And um, there was the incident at Twin Oaks recently about the you know, flag raising. And uh, I wonder what you might, um, might think about that. Well, all I know is what I've read in the papers. And I've known Lucian Shen for, uh, for nearly 20 years. Uh, he's a, 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 a very um, uh, able uh, diplomat, and uh, he comes from a, from a storied family. I think his grandfather was one of the founders of Taipei. Um, but that job in Washington is a very delicate one because you are coexisting in the same realm with the Chinese embassy and a lot of, uh, of players uh, that... Uh, you have to be careful around. Twin Oaks is a rather special place. We have, a, 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 and I think you know, we fly the American flag in the courtyard of AIT in Taipei, and we have allowed the uh, uh, Tech Row office in Washington to d display a, a, a ROC flag, a, a Taiwan flag, uh, in the entryway to their office on, on uh, Wisconsin Avenue, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. but, Twin Oaks has been a very delicate place because when we, we broke relations with Taiwan to move to China, uh, the Chinese wanted to claim that that was now their property, and a long legal battle uh, uh, eventually found that it was bought by individuals from Taiwan, and that therefore it was going to stay with them. But we put a lot of restrictions on what could be done at Twin Oaks, and generally diplomats I mean, uh, foreign State Department uh, officers are not allowed to, to go to Twin Oaks. Mm. They go to the office on, on Wisconsin Avenue. And um, therefore, the flying of the flag there was something of a, of a, of a gamble, of a, of a provocative nature, I think, for, uh, for, for Lucian Shen. And, and the reaction of folks in the State Department didn't surprise me. I want to clarify something you just said and make sure I got that right, and I think our audience will be particularly interested in this. The Twin Oaks property is actually owned by, what is it, overseas Chinese groups as opposed to the government of Taiwan or the Republic of China? It's something like that. I'm afraid I don't remember the details, but uh, a court of law in Washington ruled against the Chinese for claiming that it was diplomatic property and should shift over to them as a result of the shift in relations. That was uh, shortly after 1998 uh, uh, when, we, when we made the shift from, uh, from Taipei to, to Beijing. So the property was allowed to be kept by them. I've been there uh, as the AIT director. I was able to go, and, and, and David Lee, who was a good friend and was the, the head of the office there in Washington for many years, invited me and my family to have, have a few uh, meals there. But that was because I was working for AIT and not for the State Department, per I se. See. And uh, the, the idea of the flag being raised there, Lucian's a smart guy, and I'm just not sure why he did that, because uh, it was clearly not going to uh, be well received by people in uh, the White House or the State Department. Mm. And, and the other thing you said uh, uh, is that, and I saw this, and, I'm, and you said it, but I want to confirm it, is that the U.S. flag is flying at AIT in Taipei. 
Yes, but AIT's counterpart is the Techno Office on Wisconsin Avenue. It is not Twin Oaks. Okay. okay we, but... we had an embassy in uh, Taipei, which we abandoned when we when we left uh, uh, the diplomatic relationship and shifted to Beijing. And that, that territory was never used again by us. Okay. And Twin Oaks was, was meant to be used in very narrow terms. And the idea of, of flying a flag there was certainly going to be uh, a red flag, if you will, to people who managed the cross-strait relations in the State Department. Okay, well, we're going to take another break now, and uh, you're watching Think Tank Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest is Dr. Stephen M. Young. We're having a very interesting discussion about his perspective uh, and views on Taiwan. Uh, his views are particularly relevant, given the fact he served as U.S. Ambassador there. We'll be right back. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He asks them these questions, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's question. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon uh, <laughs> every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the Internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world, and there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on ThinkTech. Aloha. Uh, welcome back to ThinkTech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest uh, today is Dr. Stephen M. Young, uh, who served as de facto ambassador to Taiwan. He also served as consul general to Hong Kong, a position which is essentially a, a, an ambassadorial position. Uh, we want to switch over now and talk about uh, some of his impressions about recent events in Hong Kong, and that especially would be the Umbrella Movement. Um, Steve, as you see it, what, were the, what was the cause of the Umbrella Movement? Well, it's pretty clear. When I was there, Bill, there was a, an ongoing discussion by all parties, but particularly by the, the, the Democratic camp, what we call the Pan-Democrats, mm -hmm. about how China was going to implement its pledge to introduce universal suffrage first to the chief executive elections in 2017 and then to the LegCo elections, Legislative Council elections in 2020. When the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress basically said, everybody can vote, but we're going to vet the candidates, that was uh, uh, throwing a match into a, a box of Tinder because that had been the fear of the pan-democrats all along. The fact of the matter is, the pan-democratic camp, and there's a number of parties that, that fit in that, had always pulled very well in local elections in Hong Kong. So the perception was universal suffrage would give them a fair chance at contesting to be the leader of, of Hong Kong, the chief executive. When China did this, it was quite clear that they were saying, we cannot abide a pan-democrat being uh, the head of Hong Kong. Mm. I, I guess there's so many interpretations of universal suffrage, and in, in one, you know, one sense it means well everybody gets to vote, okay. But other people interpret it to mean that well it means everybody gets yeah. to vote, but you know, the you the candidates are freely selected, and which doesn't seem to be the idea that Beijing has in mind for Hong Kong elections. Well, I can quote Molotov's famous uh, saying in the 1940s when they were talking about democratic elections in Eastern Europe. He said, the trouble with democratic elections is you never know what's going to happen. And uh, communist uh, powers don't like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I, I was trying to say, they, they wanted to define universal suffrage as uh, a very narrowly prescribed uh, contest between pre-selected candidates. And, and as I was trying to say a second ago, North Korea has universal suffrage. Everybody <laughs> votes, but they vote for one guy. <laughs> right. You know? so, so that's not what you want. There was clearly going to be a fight over this, and when the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress decided to make it clear that a pan-Democrat could not be a candidate, I was not surprised that it led the street protests. Mm. Mm. What I was surprised by, to some extent, was how young people dominated that, because uh, I knew, I spoke at all the universities, and I knew 
uh, something about young people, but I didn't see them as being as political as they came to be in, in last fall's demonstrations. I'm very proud of it. You know, that's a very interesting comment because it seems for so long, Thai, um, Hong Kong, you know, what, they had no political sense at all. I mean, it was a British crown colony. Um, they seemed to be reasonably happy with that. Uh, everybody was interested in making money. Hong Kong was all about making money. It still is, as, as far as I can see. But then you have this, the, the younger generation that seemed to be so interested in politics. Um, it, it's, just, it's a phenomenal yeah. change. Not just the younger generation, Bill. I, I, I think uh, uh, having spent three and a half years there as the uh, uh, Consul General and having traveled through Hong Kong for the previous uh, 30 years before I took that job, I knew that there were a lot of people who thought differently. That The fact is that many of them were nervous by the turnover and, and, and insisted that the British... Uh, uh, promise that there would be a move toward democratic elections, toward universal suffrage in the basic law uh, and the UK PRC agreement that was forged in the run-up to 1997. But uh, everyone knew that China would, in the end, define the particulars. And when they define them so narrowly in, on the 31st of August, uh, it, it was a bound to cause trouble there. Mm. No, you, um, as far as I um, know, you and a couple of other, two other previous U.S. Consul Generals, um, Consul Generals in Hong Kong, wrote a letter to the Administrator of Hong Kong, of the SAR, the Special Administrative Region, Mr. Leung. Could you tell us about that letter? Yeah, um, my friend Richard Boucher, who was the Consul General during the turnover, and Dick Williams, who's a terrific man and was Consul General, I think, in the late 80s or early 90s, and I signed that letter. And frankly, others of our colleagues would have been more interested in signing, but they had jobs or positions where they felt they had to remain a little bit more, more aloof. Um, because the point was, and this was done uh, in late September, as I recall, um, we felt there was going to be no way to resolve the uh, standoff between the protesters and the so-called un umbrella uh, revolution and the government without a dialogue. And in the end, there was one dialogue at that level that Carrie Lamb, the uh, very able uh, chief secretary, the number two officer in the Hong Kong government, conducted with the students, but I think it was a little too late. Mm. Carrie is somebody I have a lot of time for. I've known her reasonably well in the three years plus that I was in Hong Kong, and I think she's a very smart woman who also has um, the ability to understand Beijing's interests without uh, sacrificing the feelings uh, of the Taiwan people, of the Hong Kong people. But uh, I, by the time the, the students sat down with her, I think Beijing had curtailed what Miss Lamb could talk about with them, and the students were already um, of the mind that nobody from the government could be an able and mm. Mm, Very interesting. Um, well, we're, we're coming into, uh, we, we've got about four minutes left here, and um, I, I, you mentioned to me you had some things that you wanted to bring out, and I said fine, and um, what's on your mind? Well, uh, obviously, we've been talking about two parts of uh, Greater China that have uh, um, a more of a, an international and a, and a Western tilt than, say, PRC proper. And uh, in my long experience with both Hong Kong and Taiwan, I have always been impressed by and supported the quest for democratic processes. I supported them in Taiwan when the Roman Dom was still the uh, monopoly uh, uh, owner of power at the center, and I supported them in Hong Kong. On behalf of the U.S. government, in both cases, I, I want to stress that. I, I was always very tightly connected to uh, uh, President uh, Clinton and President Bush back in the early days and President Obama later on in terms of their support for the concept of, of uh, democracy and universal suffrage. So when I was speaking publicly in those two places, I was reflecting U.S. policy. Um, we were very pleased by the development of democracy 
and you got to give a lot of credit to John Jing Guo and, and, and Li Dong Hui for that as well, but which came to fruition in a sense with the election of uh, uh, an opposition candidate, Chen Sui Bin, in presidency in 2000. In Hong Kong, it's been a little bit tougher because the Chinese, uh, and this is my main point, the Chinese are afraid of democracy. They're afraid of public uh, opinion. Mm. It's, it's evident the way they try and control the internet. There's a lot of ways you can see it. And they see um, the idea of democratic processes in, in Hong Kong and Taiwan as a threat to their monopolistic control of power in the PRC. And, and it's, it's probably a good sense that they should be worried because the economic and uh, social development of China over the last 30, 40 years has been similar to that of societies throughout the world, in particular in Asia, like Korea, like the Philippines, like Thailand, like the in Indonesia, where the people finally say, hey, when do we get to have a say in politics? And China's saying, well, you don't. And uh, uh, they're going to have trouble with Hong Kong and Taiwan when, in fact, they should be looking at it in a different way and saying, we can learn a lot from these ethnically, linguistically, and culturally Chinese places that are managing their development problems in a more open and different way than us. Mm. I'm afraid the Communist Party and Xi Jinping as its current leader uh, lack confidence in themselves to put their policies really to the people in, uh, in democratic uh, selection processes. Wow, that's an interesting thought. And with that, uh, I think we'll close here. And I'd like to thank uh, you for watching today. I'd like to thank our guest, uh, Dr. Young, for joining us uh, from New Hampshire. Uh, next week, our time slot will be just a little bit different. We'll be coming to you on February the 5th, which is a Thursday from 4 to 5. Our guest will be Dr. Larry Foster from the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law. And he'll be talking about recent developments in Chinese law. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next Thursday, uh, February the 5th at 4 o'clock. Thank you.